Good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming here. We have the Nani Palkewala Memorial Lecture today, and uh, we have our distinguished guest, Mr. S. Ramadurai, gracing uh, us with his presence. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to invite the dignitaries on the dais, uh, Deputy Director Prasanna Majumdar, Professor A.K. Suresh, uh, Sir, Mr. Ramadurai, Mr. Y.H. Palagam, Professor Joshi, if you could just join us on the dais, please. As our welcome, I would request uh, Deputy Director Professor Prasanna Majundar to hand over a floral bouquet to Mr. Ramadurai. I will uh, request Professor Suresh to kindly hand over a bouquet to Mr. Pa Palika. I would like to request Mr. Y.H. Malagam, who is the chairman of the Nanan Palkawala Trust, to come say a few words on the purpose of this lecture. So. Uh, good evening. Uh, I thought uh, before we ask Mr. Ramadura to deliver his talk, it would be useful if I could tell you a little bit about Mr. Palkiwala and about the Palkiwala lecture series. To an earlier generation, I think it would be completely unnecessary to introduce Mr. Palkiwala or to speak about him because he was a legend in his lifetime. But he passed away about 16 years ago, and it's quite possible that some of you may not know enough about this remarkable person. Nani Palkiwala was a man of many parts. He was a erudite scholar. He was an outstanding jurist a staunch defender of the Constitution, a social reformer, and many more. But perhaps the most outstanding advocate of his generation. Before he was 30 years old, he wrote the most authoritative book on Indian taxation. And this immediately catapulted him as India's foremost tax lawyer. But his lasting fame is not as a tax lawyer. His lasting fame is as a constitutional lawyer who repeatedly, in a number of very high profile cases, defended the Constitution whenever Parliament tried to encroach upon civil liberty and human rights of citizens. His crowning achievement was the Kesavananda Bharati case, where he single-handedly persuaded a 13-member bench of the Supreme Court that the power of Parliament to amend the Constitution was not unlimited, and that Parliament cannot make any amendment which damages or destroys the essential features of the Constitution. This decision, popularly known as the Fundamental Rights Case, provides for all time the fundamental protection to our nation against an authoritative government. However, Nani's contribution to Indian society goes much beyond his constitutional fights to protect the, the Constitution. Perhaps his equal an even greater contribution is the manner in which he spoke out throughout his life, through his writings and his speeches, fearlessly on all issues which affected the national interests. There is no non-political figure who spoke so often and so widely and to such larger audiences than Nani did. In his annual budget speeches at the Brevon Stadium, the audience often exceeded one lakh of persons. And Mr. Vajpayee once said in a public platform 
that Nani was the best finance minister India never had. However, Nani's preferred audience was always the youth, and some of his most important speeches were his addresses to various universities, both in India and abroad. Nani was India's ambassador to the United States, and during his 20-month stay as the ambassador, he gave 171 speeches. That is an average of two speeches per week, mostly to American universities. Nani's convocation addresses in India are memorable, both for the profundity of their thought as also the felicity of his language. And I would like to refer to only two of these. In January 1980, he spoke to Excelera in Jamshedpur. He said that there is a vast range of significant behaviors in which the law does not and ought not to interfere. He said obedience to the unenforceable was by definition not easy to practice or to inculcate, but it was ultimately the only true test of character. And in January 1972, he delivered the convocation address in Bangalore University. And he said that the treason of the intellectual consists of his not speaking out loud and clear for the values that he, by his vision and the very nature of his personality, holds sacred. Nani passed away in December 2002, and some of us, his friends and admirers, constituted Nani A. Palkevala Memorial Trust to perpetuate his memory and carry forward the issues to which he devoted his whole life. The Trust has many activities, but the Nani Palkevala Memorial Lecture Series is perhaps the most important of these activities. Nani always believed that the very essence of a democracy was the ability of its citizens to engage fearlessly in a public debate on all issues of national interest. This is the hallmark of great republics like Greece and Rome. However, for this debate to be meaningful, it should be dispassionate and well-informed. Otherwise, with ignorant and prejudicial participants, the debate can degenerate into a vehicle for hate and violence. The need for an informed discussion has never been as great as it is today, but history shows that this is not unique to this country. In the presidential election in the United States in 1928, the Democratic candidate, Alfred E. Smith, was a Catholic. And because of his religion, he was the victim of a vicious public campaign against him. In the course of a speech, he made the following remarks, which are worth noting. He said, if there are any considerable number of people that are going to listen to appeals to their passion and to their prejudice, if bigotry and intolerance and their sister vices are going to succeed, it is dangerous for the future life of the Republic. And the best way to kill anything un-American is to drag it out into the open because anything un-American cannot live in the sunlight. The Nani Apalkiwala Memorial Lecture Series has been conceived of in this spirit. It brings together some of the most eminent persons in our society who have generously volunteered their services to address the brightest minds amongst the youth which reside in the IIMs and the IITs. And through this series, 
whereby about six to eight lectures are organized each year in various IIMs and IITs, we hope that the most influential youth in our country are better informed of matters of national interest. There can be no better person than Mr. Ramadurai to speak to you today. He can be, in fact, your role model. And the subject on which he will speak is perhaps the most important area in providing opportunities to our growing population of employables. With these words, I'd like to invite Mr. Ramadurai to deliver his speech. Excuse me, before I do that, maybe I would like someone to introduce Mr. Ramadurai to you. Uh, welcome, uh, welcome to this lecture. It is my honor and privilege to introduce Mr. Ramadurai. Mr. Ramadurai has been in public service since February 2011, having completed five-year term in 2016 in the area of skill development. During his tenure as the chairman of National Skill Development Agency and the National Skill Development Corporation, his approach was to standardize the skilling effort, ensure quality and commonality to uh, community of outcomes by leveraging technology and creating an exclusive environment to cooperate, collaborate, and coexist. He strongly believes that empowering youth with the right skills can define the future of the country. Mr. Ramadurai is currently the chairman of advisory board at Tata Strive, which is the Tata Group's CSR skill development initiative that aims to address the present pressing national need of skilling youth for employment, entrepreneurship, and community enterprise. In addition to the above position, he continues to be the chairman of Air Asia and Tata Technologies Limited. He also serves as an independent director on the boards of Hindustan Liver Limited, Asian Paints Limited, and Piramal Indust Enterprises Limited. In March 2016, he retired as the chairman of Bombay Stock, Stock Exchange after having served uh, for a period of six years on the board. Mr. Ramadurai took over as a CEO of Tata Consultancy Services in 1996 when company's revenues were $155 million. Since then, he led the company through some of its most exciting phases, including its going public in 2004. In October 2009, he retired as CEO and leaving a $6 billion global IT service company to his successor. He was then appointed as a vice chairman and held the office till he retired in October 2014 after an association of over four decades with the company. Given his passion, for, uh, given his passion to work for social sector and community initiatives, he serves as a chairman on the Council of Management at National Institute of Advanced Studies and chairperson of governing board at Tata Institute of Social Sciences. He is also the president of, president of Society for Rehabilitation of Crippled Children, which has recently built a specialty children's hospital in Mumbai. In recognition of Ramadurai's commitment and dedication to IT industry, he was awarded Padma Bhushan, the uh, third highest civilian honor in January 2006. In April 2009, he was awarded CBE by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II for his contribution to the Indo-British economic relations. In 2016, he was awarded the Economic Times Lifetime Achievement Award for his glorious contribution to Tata Consultancy Services. His academic credentials include bachelor's degree in physics from University, uh, Delhi University, a bachelor's degree in engineering in electronics and telecommunications from Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, a master's degree in computer science from University of California, USA. In 1993, Ramadurai attended Sloan School of Management, Management's highly acclaimed senior executive development program. So we have a very eminent personality today here, and we look forward to hearing of his thoughts. Thank you. Mr. Vyach Malegam, Chairman Nani Palkiwala Trust, Memorial Trust, 
डिप्टी डायरेक्टर प्रोफेसर प्रसन्न मजुमदार प्रोफेसर ए के सुरेश डॉक्टर पाठक डिस्टिंग गेस्ट लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन एंड आई आई टी एंस ए वेरी गुड इवनिंग टू ऑल ऑफ यू इट्स अ ग्रेट ऑनर टू बी स्पीकिंग एज पार्ट ऑफ द नानी पलकी वाला लेक्चर सीरीज फॉर ही इज अ पर्सन आई ह्यूजली एडमायर In fact, it was only in February 2016 that I de- recall delivering a speech at the Nani Palkiwala Memorial Lecture Series in Chennai. It has been the most fascinating and enriching experience to be able to read about his vast experiences and learnings from several sources that we collated since then. As students, which we all are. because it's a age of lifelong learning i would sincerely advise you to go back and read the several books that have been penned on the journey of this great legend i think some of them are extremely easy to read in the shortness of the sentences and the precision at which he which which he delivers is something amazing fortunately for me i was associated with him then he was the chairman of the executive committee of tcs for several years he witnessed through tcs the changes led by the digital revolution and was gifted with the ability to see far behind his time i would like to imagine if he was living today he would be excited about the potential of today's technologies and would have urged us to launch an assault on poverty inequity and an unemployment at the same time the humanitarian in him would urge us to with equal gusto to be beware of the technology's irresponsible use that was the kind of person we are talking about such was his magnetic personality and illuminative mind that people thronged to hear his union budget lectures which is the articulated which were the largest ever public meetings on an economic subject he spoke with absolute clarity clear mind and a very very strong heart he fought for the highest ideals of constitutional rights and for democracy even as he lived a very simple life in his own words he was not obsessed with material possessions or worldly success he was far more attracted by things of the mind and the spirit in today's material world dr palkiwala's words are a breath of fresh air it's a paradox of our times that the more we make things equal the more unequal our world becomes technology highways are enabling information equity but at the same cannot be said about income as per a survey by the international rights group oxfam in india the richest 1% hold 73% of the wealth generated in 2017 this is not a sustainable model this inequity does not come from capability issues it comes from the lack of opportunity and i am a great believer in the ingenuity of the indian to progress and thrive when there is an opportunity we see this in great strides made by india in many fields be it our world renowned space program or our capabilities in the information technology sector we reap the benefits today of the investments made decades ago in the institutions of higher learning including the iits back then we needed scientific talent to match the great emphasis on swadeshi and the adoption of a path of industrialization based on heavy and capital goods industry but this came at a great cost the least attention if i may say so to primary and secondary vocational education today we are paying a price for it and the time has come to meet come to invest and correct the past wrong 
Clearly, the past is inextricably linked to the present. As will our present determine our future, for the future to be sustainable, our growth model has to be inclusive and is no longer a choice. It's about survival. At school, we learned about Darwin and evolution. Evolution, we were told, happened in a time scale of millions of years. But evolution was taking place in 18-month cycles powered by Moore's law and not in time scale of a millennia. Furthermore, from Darwin, we took home the severe and unforgiving lesson of the survival of the fittest. From India's perspective, it's not only about physical fitness, but a certain institutional and social resilience that enables us to survive geopolitical stress and, of course, the technological disruption. Resilience is a worthy position given that today's society are faced with multifarious challenges. For a nation whose average population is young, clearly the top position amongst these challenges is that of jobs and livelihoods. Our education system therefore needs to make our youth better prepared and therefore resilient for the dynamism of the jobs of the future and we need to invest in that now. We built and nurtured our IITs but we built and neglected our ITIs. The oldest IIT Kharagpur was established in the year 1951, while the ITIs were first started just a decade later in 1969 with the aim of promoting industrialization in India. But both had different trajectories. We celebrated the power of our mind and degenerated the artistry of our hands. Today we are trying to salvage respectability for working with your hands when it has long been in a time warp, enveloped and covered with a complex web of perceptions, of perceptions of negativity. So perhaps we can find it in our hearts to acknowledge that the IITs owe something to the ITIs. India's cheap labor force will soon have to compete with the rise of autonomous machines. Although modest today, the annual shipments of robots to India is likely to double in the next three years. There are 58 robots for every 10,000 workers in the automobile industry. Big data market is estimated to be 1 lakh crore market in India by 2025. Juxtaposition this with the fact that the vocational training capacity as a percentage of our workforce is under 1%. The e-commerce retailer Amazon.com was one of the first e-tailers e-retailers to experiment with the use of Kiva robots to move boxes around its fulfillment centers and it found the robots so useful that it bought the company that made them. Amazon deployed 1,000 Kivas to work in its warehouses. Then it ramped that to 10,000 robotic workers and further to 15,000. At the last report, Amazon had 100,000 robots working for it. To put that in context, the total number of employees of Amazon is only 5.6 lakh. As of today, one in five, every five full-time employees of Amazon is a robot. The labor market will need to undergo dramatic change with the loss of some kinds of jobs and the creation of new types of jobs that need skills that we do not teach today. We can safely assume that anything that can be automated will be automated and skills that cannot be digitized or automated will become more valuable and these are what our education system should build. Our education system needs to cover lost ground and needs to deliver the real needs of the economy and more importantly it needs to re-engineer itself to be continuously responsive to the dynamism of the industry. As a philosophy, we need to actively embrace and promote vocationalization of education. Broad basing what we teach and how we teach is the first step. Today, manufacturing is as much about the art of design as selling is about the science of preferences. Differences are blurring. Using approaches that connect different disciplines, example, a rangori to teach geometry, will bring in multidisciplinary thinking and pattern recognition. Encouraging the study of arts and humanities will bring in design thinkers and social engineers. Most importantly, including vocational training at an early stage of learning 
will eradicate biases and will make it the new normal. How we shape the minds, what skills we develop must be guided by the demands of the future. On one hand, educational reform needs to inculcate analytical skills, critical evaluation, pattern recognition, and other such cognitive skills. On the other hand, it needs to offer opportunities for creativity, design, and working with the hands. Our young need to explore their own interests and grow their talent rather than be guided by narrow predetermined hierarchies or status symbol jobs. The downward slide of values is also reflected in respectability for skilled vocations. As a colonized nation, we may have in fact even diminished the stature of highly skilled artisans and craftsmen. For example, in Japan, a skilled weaver or a carpenter is venerated as a living national treasure. For decades, our government has indeed been honoring skilled craftsmen with awards, but somehow we have missed the opportunities for celebrating and advocating skills. Then when our Prime Minister tenderly holds the withered hands of an aged weaver in public, it sends out a very powerful message. But nevertheless, how do we as entrepreneurs and technologists communicate the pride in the unparalleled skills portfolio that our nation still has? A farmer's child should grow up excited about the possibilities of smart technologies that he or she can bring in agriculture that will help increase yield. And a family of craftsmen should look up to the young girl in the family to enable a direct market connect through a portal. Dr. Palkiwala believed that education was the technique of transmitting civilization, but in order that it may do so, it had to perform two major functions. It must enlighten the understanding and enrich the character. It must enlighten the understanding and enrich the character. Who but him could remind us of the highest purpose of education to build the moral fabric of the society? It took another visionary, Professor C.K. Prahlad, to drive home the realization that we were walking on a dangerous chasm. On one side was the potential of harnessing a skilled, youthful population to fuel growth on the other, a social disaster led by frustrated, jobless youth. This was back in 2007, 2008, and it was around this time that the issue of skill development got national attention. I think I was invited in 2011 by the erstwhile Prime Minister, Dr. Manmohan Singh, to put my experience behind this burning national challenge, and I gladly took up the honor. Initially, it felt strange to be seated along with the government officials and opposite to my colleagues from the industry, but I soon got used to it. I realized that the scale and complexity of India's skilling problem was unprecedented in the world, compounded by the fact that demand and supply data was minimal, there were no ecosystem for vocational training, apart from the ITIs like I mentioned, and absolutely no national standards. Clearly, we had to develop a whole new industry vertical, and we made a beginning on all of these fronts. And I think I'm happy to say that the current government also continued on that journey. And today, there is a very strong institutional structure with the skill ministry at the helm, supported by the National Skill Development Corporation, spurring the creation of training providers, the sector skill councils, which are essentially the industry verticals, creating national occupation standards across various sectors, national skills qualification framework, which defines the national occupation standards and the qualification packs that enables equivalence between the mainstream and the vocational education the National Skill Development Agency that provides the necessary quality oversight. I think all government skilling schemes follow common norms of payments, and skill developed missions in the state have greater participation in implementing the various government schemes. I'm also convinced that convergence of initiatives like the Skill India, Digital India, Startup India, and Make in India will have a multiplier effect, the impact of which will be visible in the next three to five years. I think the creation of the framework has helped kickstart an ecosystem of investors, private training providers, industry-driven competency standards, and of course the standardization of content and more recently new financial instruments 
such as the development impact bonds. Through the British Asian Trust, we launched about two weeks ago, $11 million educational impact bond, where the risk capital is covered and then the donors based on impact will be funding the actual uh, thing happening on the ground. All this is flowing into what is becoming an institutional skilling sector. To bring about a lasting change, a twin phenomenon is required in the skilling value chain. The higher education and the university system need to be vocationalized, and at the same time, industry must open up as the learning arena through internships and apprenticeships. So what we call a hands-on and the mind. While this is not without challenges, we must celebrate a small, we must celebrate small successes. A successful example of vocational training integration with school began in 2012. When a pilot was launched for the students in the 9th and 12th standards in 40 schools of Haryana covering four sectors, IT-IT enabled services, auto, retail and security with 4,000 students. Skill subjects were offered into the academic choices. The model developed by NSDC in association with MHRD and the Haryana School Department has today progressed in the state to cover 1,001 schools in 12 sectors and covering more than 1.5 lakh students. From 2013 onwards, the Haryana model was rolled out nationally in 27 states, including the Union territories, covering overall 8,398 schools and catering to over 7.5 lakh students from the 9th and the 12th standards, 9th to the 12th standards. As on date, to impart skill training in schools, states have now options to choose from 73 national skills qualification curriculum cleared job roles across 21 sectors. The curricula and contents are developed in association with the respective sector skill councils or SSCs as they are called. Now Brazil has similar socio-economic and demographic profiles as in India. They have a three-tiered vocational education and training system. The continued formation level courses are for the broadest targeted population and anyone can enroll in this type of program. There are no requirements regarding educational degree or age. Their goal is to provide an initial qualification to those whose level of educational achievement is low or have no practical training or experience. The second level is technical courses which provide professional training to students enrolled in secondary school and secondary school graduates the third level is technological courses, which are equivalent to tertiary level courses and last for three years. I think talking of these three-year courses, our universities are seeking a large number of first-generation learners, given our glamour for degrees. However, there is little realization that mere degrees do not get jobs unless universities begin to offer non-traditional degree specialization. For example, BA in retail, BSc in environment, or BCom in logistics. With a much needed push from the top, many progressive universities are broadening their offerings with support from sector skill councils and industry partnerships. And one of the thing is with what I do or what we do at Tata Strive, where both the industry connect and the curriculum content and some of the Government of India schemes and for nonprofit that has scaled up to 2.7 lakh graduates with an employment of almost 90%. What is also happening is the recognition given to credits earned from certificate and diploma courses with the national qualification framework, which over time will be mainstreamed. As chairman of the Tata Institute of Social Sciences, we too saw the potential of enhancing and en enriching the university system through vocationalization. The National University Student Skill Development Program, NUSSD as it is called, Implemented by TIS is one such scalable model that helps students acquire job-related skills while they are pursuing their degree courses. This can easily be replicated across several thousand colleges in the country, thereby addressing the issue of large-scale unemployability amongst graduates in India. The NESSD program today has reached over 20,000 students across five states and continues to grow. There's just one institution, Tata Institute of Social Sciences, doing that. The TIS School of Vocational Education, through its training partners, also provides the required structural, structured classroom sessions while inducting them into the work settings. 
This initiative enables those who have dropped out of the formal education system after the 12th standard to pursue education in the vocational streams. Today, there are 7,162 active students as part of this program, and over 27,000 students have graduated to join the workforce across cities in India. Again, the employment rate is very, very high. The government tenure opened my eyes to the real India through my travels to remote corners of Northeast Kashmir to the furthest south. I met youth, women, parents, and I was griped, gripped by their problems. I also became convinced that the House of Tatas must respond in a stronger way to this national challenge. A large business and community footprint was the unique Tata capability. This led to the formation in 2014 of Tata's tribe, a skill development initiative created to serve the needs of the most disadvantaged youth. The Tata's tribe has impacted over 2.5 lakh youth through a model that uniquely combines pedagogy, methodology, and technology. I spoke earlier about the equity of opportunities, MOOCs, massive online open courses brought in by Coursera, edX, Khan Academy, etc., has brought learning into the homes of people. The trend has already begun. AI tutors by Carnegie will use this for personalized tutoring of the students, required remedial learning, thereby reducing the cost of collegiate education. AI-based methods for automatic grading of students is getting popular. The challenge to deploy such platforms in vocational education is twofold. The readiness of the learner and the challenge of demonstrating the skill has to be tested. A middle path is emerging, what we call as the digital model, which allows the instructor-led learning, self-directed learning, and practical training combined in a pedagogical sound way. By creating a meta-system of partners, classroom providers, digital platform provider and the hands-on training provider, the model becomes scalable and enables anytime, anywhere learning. Such models are being tried already by the Tatas as an alternative to the slower to develop brick and mortar one. I'm happy that IIT Bombay has also undertaken a number of technology-enabled initiatives towards the skill development. The Lakshya program is an interesting initiative of ESOS educational ser services for outreach at scale and see the Center for Distance Education, Engineering Education program. I think Lakshya combines online learning with the face-to-face -face sessions, providing the learner the freedom of engaging at any time and place convenient to them. And then having an option of an active discussion to ask doubts and questions, clarified by the faculty and also face-to-face -face sessions on weekends in a powerful model. Also impressive is the spoken tutorial initiative of the Talk to Your Teacher activity of the National Mission on Education through information and communication technology launched by the Ministry of Human Resource Development. The spoken tutorial has a 10 minute long audio video tutorial created for self-learning being dubbed into 22 Indian languages exponentially increases the accessibility to students across India. So the power of multiplier effect. Its benefits can be varied as seen from the successful training module for new mothers and health workers on child health care, which cover crucial topics and vital information that will help them to early, easily understand and grasp the basics of health and nutrition of a newborn baby in order to curb the infant mortality and spread awareness on malnutrition. I'm told that thousands of mothers and health workers have benefited through this training. Another spoken tutorial course is for construction of biogas plants which is designed in Marathi language for masons to help them understand construction process of a biogas plant on their own. A very innovative spoken tutorial is being designed to help train aspiring paramedics on how to handle the ECG and other facilities in special ambulances. Using the special ambulance, Dr. Thomas Alexander of Kovai Medical Center Hospital recently demonstrated that the mortality rate can be reduced by 90% through a year-long pilot. All of these are highly commendable initiatives and my congratulations to the teams leading them. Apart from such institutional measures, many of you would be contemplating venturing out of your own. I would urge you to look at the many problems to be solved and the opportunities waiting to be harnessed. As mentioned before, with the impact of Industry 4.0 and the resultant automation, it brings some jobs. Some jobs will certainly become obsolete. New, still unknown jobs may find their way and people will need to continuously 
unlearn, relearn and upskill. This is a great opportunity for us to reinvent ourselves, to help those excluded from the digital revolution, the disadvantaged communities leapfrog and catch up. The pathways can be novel and different leveraging the technology tools we have at our disposal. India is unique in that we are the only country where a majority of the population continues to pursue pre-industrial jobs using pre-industrial tools and methods. Where else in the world can you find over a million handloom weavers? Where else can you one find snake catchers? They are the duck-billed platypus of the skills jobs world. They are a befuddling anomaly that should be theoretically not exist. And yet they do. And how do we craft pathways to the 21st century livelihood for these people? For example, we are trying to work with a group of Irula snake catchers and IIT Madras researchers to extract high-value proteins from the snake venom. What aspects of their archaic skill should we treasure? Creating pathways to the 21st century is the need of the hour. Through our work with weavers in the Northeast, we have found that the most valuable skill that millions of illiterate weavers have is the extraordinary ability to implement hundreds if not thousands of unique design straight from their head. Using some of the most primitive looms without even making a sketch on a piece of paper. And yet the weaver bears the entire risk of error for weaving with the middleman buying imperfect designs for as little as 10% of the cost of the raw materials. This creates an enormously punitive disincentive for the weaver to try any new design. As a solution, a TCS team and I, as their mentor, created a platform for weavers to access the 21st century skills and markets, and it has been successfully launched in the Northeast, Varanasi, and Kanchipuram. Similarly, in Gondia, buffalo horns are exported at a low value to Germany. Digging deeper, we discovered that buffalo horn from Gondia ends up in the highly crafted high-end Swiss spectacle frames with thousand times the value of the raw material. It takes fairly little effort to acquire the skills needed to reach higher up in the global value chains. And going into the 21st century, India has, the necessity, necessarily, India has to necessarily equip itself by investing in science, technology, mathematics, design and engineering skills and move up the skills value chain. I share these examples with a reason. There's an existing resources, resource or talent an opportunity that offers immense value, including monetary benefit. Now, to connect the two, you need to be an entrepreneur or a visionary, and that could be you. You have what it takes to spot the opportunity, and doing so, you would be empowering a community. Today, the world looks at India as a laboratory for democratic and inclusive development. Indeed, many believe that innovations from India have great salience and resonance across the rest of the world. Without us realizing it, India has become the center of innovative ideas and solutions that create positive changes in the lives of people across the world. I hope and believe that with a collective effort from all of us, we'll have many more of these successes in the future. Finally, I would like to conclude by reminding ourselves of the ideals with which we need to live our lives. If Dr. Nani Palkiola were here, he would have said, on the university campus, we must stress the importance of self-fulfillment but not self-indulgence, group cohesiveness, but not group jingoism, work and achievement, but not power and acquisitiveness for their own sake. Our biggest tribute would be to follow this path in the best way we can. Thank you very much. If anyone has any questions, uh, please go ahead. In this larger landscape that you have painted, is there any specific suggestion that you could give where IIT Bombay, which is now as an institution of eminence, is trying to enlarge its activities in various fields? Uh, would there be any suggestions as to how an institution like ours could be more actively involved with the skill development efforts? That is one. The second question which bothers many of us is that the skills and knowledge have been unfortunately separated in our higher education. How could we perhaps re recombine them or retry them? Well, I think one is all of us must recognize we are dealing with a scale problem. Anything you take in our country 
whether it's nutrition, whether it's primary health, whether it's education, school level education, dropouts, university, university dropouts, I think it's a scale issue. I think any platform to address the scale issue, and I talked about the digital model where both physical and the digital must coexist together. I think the experiment I narrated with regard to the School of Vocational Education at the Tata Institute of Social Sciences exactly addresses this issue. Any tool sets, any engineering methods to address this scale challenge through IITs would be most welcome. Second is the graduating students of IITs can very easily become entrepreneurs, either social entrepreneurs or uh, for-profit entrepreneurs. And we are seeing a lot of that, which is a way of life. Kids come and then spend two to three years in the social sector or get into the corporate sector and come back into the social sector, which I am seeing as part of multiple foundations. I think we must encourage our children to take and follow their passion rather than compartmentalizing or blindfold them in a way we think or we thought in the past. The other point I think uh, which you articulated while we were in the lounge was with regard to how do you create these MOOCs which are very, very short term courses. Since we are talking about lifelong learning, all of us must be both a content provider as well as a content user. And how do you enlarge that content production in multiple ways because there are interdisciplinary skills which repurposes the content which makes it very exciting for a set of audience. I think those are the kind of ways I would think. And any research in this area to do certain targeted, any, uh, what do you call, interventions. If it is in the tribal areas in Chhattisgarh as an example, or in the Kashmir area where we tried through the Ministry of Home Affairs, a program called Udan way back in the four or five years ago. I think those were very, very critical because how do you bring those youth in Kashmir to the mainstream? Because some of them, when I visited there, found that uh, India is the other country rather than Kashmir is a part of India. This was the kind of things we noticed on the ground. I think anything to do some of these interventions becomes absolutely critical and necessary. Uh, I have a question, sir. Where are you? Ah, fine. Uh, I was curious to know your response to a suggestion that I have, which is actually very specific to IIT Bombay. Whether you call it as self-indulgent or not, uh, well, is open to uh, for comment. But you know, I would think that uh, we have initiated a small activity for handloom weaving amongst our design students here. And I was proposing that uh, interested students of IIT, when they graduate, they could weave their own convocation scarf. Uh, uh, I want, want a very uh, you know, quick response to you. I don't, is, is it something which is ar uh, archaic? Or? I don't think it's archaic at all. What we do now, with the Weaver platform which we have built in TCS as part of our uh, social initiatives, anytime I go to meet with somebody where I want to give a gift, I get a designer either from Pondicherry or France or anywhere and then ask them to specify a unique design. We then source the silk or the cotton threads from Mysore and the whole design to production is within two days. And the whole scarf or the shawl is produced within a span of two days. Unlike it takes 30 to 45 days and you have to put those jacquards, etc. It's a very impossible task. And then pay the particular weaver exactly what he needed and it's comparable to anything in the world. Now we are working towards a Japanese type of a quality to get into this. But anywhere I agree, that's a very, very good suggestion with regard to, and we must encourage that. Thank, thank you. There's just one more related question, if I may. Uh, uh, now for us in, in the design school to hire a master weaver, uh, under the current norms is rather difficult, you know. Uh, what is it that one can do uh, to get certain norms uh, reviewed in some sense? I think the Institute of Eminence may give you that flexibility. Isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I agree to Professor Fartak's suggestion, but I have another clarification question. That is, uh, you come out with the uh, vocational training for the whole country, Maybe some problem, from problem wherever they are, we go to find it out. But I, my question is how to forecast what kind of, what level of training will be required from different sources. I'll give an example. Let's supposing your government of India is building uh, 
Prime Minister Rural Road Development Program. Now, this could also produce some problems in the sense when you have a very all connected roads, all the villages are six lakhs villages all connected. Then what could be the problem? That youth will be going for more and more more bikes, motorcycles, and then there will be you know pollution and accidents and repair of those things. I think one should forecast before whatever the projects we have taken, offshoot of that could again give a. I would suggest let's say two three villages join together. We were talking of let's see nine tenth eleven twelfth standard vocational training. So let these projects, these problems, uh, which will be futuristic particularly. So we have to do that way training of these people in that one, and then particularly in the rural area, and uh, see two three villages join hand, two three people set up a workshop, repairing the vehicles, and uh, uh, environmental pollution, safety, and all these they will be doing. Maybe two three different trades could join hand to set up a workshop. So six lakhs villages. Maybe two lakhs workshop again six lakh employment new employment could be created and trained through the vocational training uh, nine tenth eleven twelve. I mean we have to see all the ongoing projects offshoot of those when again think of future what the negative part and then make use of the best way. I mean that sort of training is required. I think that's a comment, right? That's the way I see it. I think. Um, See, local level jobs or local level entrepreneurs is going to be very critical to start with. Can we make a set of villages or a particular district completely self-sufficient in the skills that are needed? The other way to look at it is if there are going to be 100 smart cities, we start planning from beginning what are the kind of skills required to support that kind of a skills, I mean, uh, smart city. Unless the planning is done and people come together to work towards that, that's why we talk about the public-private partnerships, the role of NGOs, the role of the government, etc., and then create a system which addresses some of these challenges. The other one we are trying to look at is recognition of previous skills. We don't want a weaver to be going into something where that weaver community is uh, shrunk. So how do we, at the same time, take the children of the weavers to the 21st century skills, which can still continue in those locations, so that they feel a passion for doing that. I think we've got to do multiple experiments in a country like ours and then anticipate the problems and create a knowledge base of whatever learnings are there and use it very productively. Sir, a uh, question from my end. Uh, we've seen that uh, there's been a fair amount of, on the skilling side, we've been creating supply of, uh, I would say, youth who are trained, who can work in industry. But on the demand side, how do we create demand? We've seen stagnation in industry. MSME, again, is struggling because an MSME would technically, for people that we're scaling, would be the biggest employer. From the government side, there's not enough push to develop the MSME sector, again, in terms of credit, ease of doing business. How, what can be done in that space? No, if you take the 21st century, what this country is wanting to do, you take a defense sector. The defense sector is not one organization which is going to be defining the um, skills or absorbing that many. The whole supply chain of MSME is going to be the critical need where you develop them and as well as the quality that is required for us to scale up. These are completely new skills. We have experimented or we are currently doing in uh, Tata Advanced Systems, which is completely focused on the defense related activities. We started with the promise that let's look at the overseas market to start with 100% export. So we got joint ventures with Lockheed Martin, with Sikorsky, with Boeing, with Pilatus, etc. And we produced the wingspans of the entire helicopter or the aircraft. For example, the C-130 or the S-92 class of uh, Sikorsky helicopters. From that, we entirely developed the whole supply chain and the workforce for that we have developed totally from the ITI graduates. We said over a nine month period we will scale them to be absolutely world class quality people. We also raised the bar to say that one of the shifts in this would be completely women because people said women cannot be working on the shop floor. And we have demonstrated is that a complete shift during the daytime can be done by women including the fitting, machining, tooling, everything. 
So I think you have got to be focused and passionate about developing an ecosystem of a sort because the jobs are only going to be created in the small and medium enterprises or entrepreneurs. It's not going to be the large corporations. You take the Tatas, the Birlas, the L&Ts, the Gauderis, everything put together, nothing more than 3 million. Where our need is 1 million a month. So I think we have got to look at the problem very differently. That's why I said there are some jobs which are very localized in the villages to support that village or support a community. Agriculture, we have not even touched. Healthcare for the uh, primary healthcare, we have not even touched the kind of skills that are needed. So there are enormous amount of shortages. Everybody cannot be an engineer, everybody cannot be working in Mumbai or a Delhi or a Chennai or a Calcutta or whatever. I think so we have to look at it and there are enough job opportunities we are seeing. So when he talked about the job creation across, the thing under smart cities, we've got to look at it that way. Which are the feeder into that, which are the small and medium enterprises? That's the way I would look at the problem. But there are enough experiments going on. The good thing is there are so many entrepreneurs that have joined this. So many people are working from the heart rather than just as a money-making proposition. Those CSR initiatives are very clear. I think we need more number of organizations, more number of volunteers into this. Within our own group, we have got what is called a volunteering week. So people can just spend that week in any part of the country, anywhere. But I think seeing is believing, unless you are physically there, and that's what this five years with the government gave me, where I, I have never traveled this much within the country because my whole travel in uh, TCS was only outside the country. So that's the change, that's what we have to see. I mean, even think a simple thing like a irula snake catcher, I mean, if you teach him, the kind of uh, transformation that takes place is before your eyes. Those are the small things that one has to be focused on. And it doesn't require an enormous amount of time. So, um, thank you for your talk. Um, a question about the demands we can place on industry. You mentioned upskilling throughout one's lifetime is, is required in today's environment. And so you need an environment within the firm where you can learn. So that says something about industrial relations. You need uh, pan-industry uh, skilling so that all firms within an industry, it's, there's a collective action problem. I don't want to skill because I'm fear poaching. So at the industry level, you need a certain kind of uh, relationship. So you need pan-industry associations. What demands can we make of industry and what sort of policy proposals do we need to kind of make industry up, uh, do its part in this process? My own feeling is based on our experience in the IT industry, any policy and any diktat is not going to work. We have a population, we have very bright kids, given the opportunity they are all going to be coming into the mainstream. So even if somebody poaches, you got to assume that if one is poached, there are nine others who are waiting to take up that position. So I think, um, yes, we can have an industry understanding, for example, in the IT industry through NASCOM or somebody where you say poaching is inherently bad, you invest something in the training itself. Some discipline which is self-enforced rather than as a policy by the government or something, where a policy by the government is only to make sure that all of us suffer. So I think we've got to be very realistic about these things, saying that because somebody I'm going to lose, I'm not going to train or not going to skill is a completely wrong way of thinking. There are enough people who can be brought in and then they will be more than happy to work, so long as there are opportunities to learn and then move on. And that's the environment you have to create in corporations, that's the environment you have to create in any institution, small, medium, large or whatever. In my opinion, that's what works. Somebody may agree, somebody may disagree, but we must. The only pro uh, good thing about the digitization is the equal opportunity through a platform. Today, when we source employees into the organization, we have created a platform called Ignite, where you as a college graduate or a college uh, second year, third year students can use that platform to learn. You can learn for three months, you can learn for six months, all the courses, everything. At the end of one year or whatever it is, you can take a test. The only other physical uh, requirement is face-to-face, -face, we have to see you that you are the person who took the test in the first place. I think we have sourced from 652 colleges across the country, not the IITs or the BITs or the IIITs or whatever it is, and we have recruited more than 5,000 people from every corner of this country into TCS. 
These 5,000 kids are essentially first generation kids whose parents are coolies or loaders or whatever it is. The quality of their output where we have seen is some of them we have sent them for doctoral programs in mathematics at the Chennai Mathematical Institute. Some of them are the master's program across. Some of them after three years in TCS have left and some of them are continuing and they are all part of the uh, alumni network of TCS. So I think it's possible if you look at very, very creatively and that's the need of the hour. One of the inputs we want from IITs is what is the kind of creativity, experimentation we need to try and on a continuous basis keep refining it so that we can deliver on an equal footing to anybody who wants to seek an opportunity. Uh, just recently I heard the news that uh, uh, Mahindra CEO said that 94% of IT employees are unfit for hiring because of the lack of skill. So what do you think can be done for effective skill development in colleges and such? Unfortunately, nobody asked the Mahindra CEO, is he employable in another organization? And we have to ask these questions because you can't just pass a judgment saying that nobody is employable. Then what are you doing about making them employable? That's the only answer I can give. And that's what we need to do as leaders. Can't blame somebody else and get away with it. Yes. There is a lack of uh, capabilities, lack of skills, and we, and the back-end work with the educational institutions, how to upgrade their um, infrastructure, how to upgrade their equipment, how to upgrade the faculty training. I think uh, TCS uh, with Mr. Kohli's help, we upgraded about uh, eight or ten engineering colleges with the Pune University, Pune Engineering College, and we saw the number of enrollment, the outcomes of that enrollment, PhDs, the kind of teaching, everything came out. See, we got to try some of these things instead of blaming the system because all we know, all of us know about the faults. What do we do if you see that in front of us? It's like if an accident takes place in Bombay, how many fellows are just watching, standing in a queue as if somebody is distributing something? Somebody has to do something. These are realities which we have to face. Thank you, sir. Uh I'd like to take this opportunity to invite Professor Majumdar to kindly felicitate Mr. Ramadurai with the Thank you. Raya Small token of our appreciation. Thank you, sir. I'd like to request Professor A.K. Suresh to uh, kindly hand over a memento to Mr. Y.H. Palika. Uh, Professor Joshi, if you could just give a word of thanks. Thank you. So first of all, our grateful thanks to Mr. Ramadamoy Dorai for his enlightening speech and um, you know, giving us the present state of the art of skilling India and the problems and opportunities. I mean, all problems actually are actually opportunities for all of us. So thanks a lot. And we also thank the, not least, not the last not, but the least, all the audience, though small in number, very interactive and intelligent. Thank you very much to all of you. <laughs>